Good day and welcome to Big Bad Tech. I'm your instructor, Jim Pytel. And today we're gonna to take a quick look at a representative example of a pilot operated pressure relief valve. Recall during the pressure relief valve lecture, available at the Big Bad Tech channel, we introduced and discussed the operation of a pilot operated pressure relief valve. Today's lecture is a chance to disassemble and examine an actual pilot operated pressure relief valve and identify those components that make it function, all without getting your hands dirty. Additionally, will interpret pertinent data entries on a data sheet. The particular pilot operated pressure relief valve we'll be looking at today is a Parker RP400SM. Interpreting the part numbers is astoundingly easy. The data sheet shows that Parker uses five identification fields, technically six. The five main identification fields are valve type, size, material, pressure range, and seal composition. RP means this is a pressure relief valve. No duh. The 400 size value means the valve has quarter inch NPFT threaded fittings. NPFT means national pipe taper fuel, a type of thread form designed to reduce leakage. This particular valve is inline mounted because fluid conductors are intended to be directly attached to it. S indicates the valve body is made out of steel. The M pressure range indicates the valve is intended to regulate pressure between 50 to 1000 PSI. Finally, since the fifth identification field is omitted, we know this valve has nitrile seals. Finally, finally, the sixth identification field is a design code. For this particular valve, the design code is 20, which I suppose means something to the right people. The datasheet has a pretty nice cutaway diagram and clearly indicates and labels all the constituent parts. We can see the primary spool or piston, number five in the primary passage, as well as the light biasing spring. Since the cutaway view is from the side, you kind of miss out on the fact that the piston is blocking the primary P to T passage. The P port is here and is visible in the cutaway. The T port is right about here and is not visible in the cutaway. A small passageway conducts fluid to the pilot chamber. You can see the dart, seat, spring, and manual adjustment knob. When pressure in the pilot chamber unseats the dart, the balanced piston unbalances, slides right, and opens the passage from P to T. When the dart in the pilot chamber reseats, pressure equalizes and the light biasing spring closes the passage from P to T. Let's disassemble a real valve and see if we can identify these components. Note, follow all manufacturer recommended instructions for your particular valve of interest and judiciously observe proper lockout and tagout procedures. Valves are fluid power devices and may contain fluid under pressure in certain passages if they are not properly bled and drained. Additionally, valves may contain powerful springs that forcibly eject themselves from the valve body straight into your eye when opened. Take the necessary precautions when disassembling valves. First, the valve body has five ports. Two on one side, the pressure and vent connection. Two on the other, another pressure connection, purposely plugged, and the tank connection. Finally, a purposely plugged gauge port intended for a pressure gauge indicator. Flipping the valve over, you'll note each port is clearly identified on the body. Ignore the vent port for now and consider it blocked. We'll examine the vent port when we discuss remotely operated pressure relief valves in later lectures. The reason for the two pressure ports is to assist in mounting this particular inline valve. Sometimes you want pressure and tank on opposite sides. Sometimes you want them on the same side. Whichever P port you don't use, you purposely plug. We'll remove both the gauge and pressure plug and unscrew the end cap. Note the bias spring used to hold the primary piston closed sticking out of the back. These are the springs that I was warning you about earlier. If forcibly ejected springs don't poke you in the eye, they will fly across the room and rattle down the nearest floor drain if you aren't prepared for them. Note the end cap has an O-ring around it. We can pull out the bias spring. Then pull out the primary piston. Note the piston isn't unusually discolored, silted over, or covered with any sticky residue or varnish. We'll examine contaminants and the means of filtering and conditioning fluid in later lectures. Note the pilot piston should travel freely in this primary passage. The primary section is essentially cleared. Let's turn our attention to the pilot section. We can unscrew the bonnet and pull to adjust knob assembly. We can remove the drive pin and follower and then pull out the tensioner. Tipping the valve upside down, the dart and screw rattle out. 
Again, note that the dart isn't unusually discolored, silted over, distorted, or covered with any sticky residue or varnish. A visual inspection of both the pilot and primary sections similarly indicate that the passageways are clear of contaminants. The pilot section is essentially cleared. That's it. We have disassembled this pilot-operated pressure relief valve. Reassembly is pretty much the reverse of disassembly. Let's take a quick look at some of the pertinent entries in the datasheet for this particular valve before we bring this lecture to a close. The quick reference chart shows us that this particular valve is designed to accommodate a flow rate of up to 6 gallons per minute, or 25 liters per minute. Looking at the relief pressure versus flow rate graph on the next page, we observe a collection of curves characteristic of a pressure relief valve exhibiting pressure override. Pressure override is essentially a change in relief pressure as a function of flow rate. Note the curves all use the same reference condition, a hydraulic oil with a given viscosity, or thickness, in this case of 150 SSU. We'll discuss viscosity and viscosity units in later lectures. The vertical scale is in units of bar and PSI. Given the pressure range of this valve is between 50 and 1000 PSI, we're obviously paying attention to the bottom region of this chart. The horizontal scale is percentage of rated flow. Given this particular valve is designed to accommodate a flow rate of up to 6 gallons per minute, 100% is 6 gallons per minute. 50% is 3 gallons per minute, and so on. Let's use the bottom curve to approximate how this valve would function. This curve suggests that the pressure relief valve would accommodate full flow, or 6 gallons per minute, at roughly 593 PSI. Given this exact adjustment setting scribed by the curve and a pump capable of producing, let's say, 3 gallons per minute, we could expect the relief valve to fully open at roughly 500 psi. At the far left regions of this curve, this suggests that the valve just begins cracking open at approximately 314.1 psi. Anything below this pressure, the pressure relief valve remains completely closed. Above this pressure, the pressure relief valve begins diverting flow to the tank. The curve suggests the pressure relief valve begins diverting 0.109 gallons per minute of the available 3 gallons per minute at 383.9 psi, leaving 2.89 gallons per minute for the system. Not much of a difference. At 418.8 psi, the pressure relief valve diverts approximately 0.218 gallons per minute of the available 3 gallons per minute leaving 2.78 gallons per minute for the system. Again, not much of a difference, but you'll notice an increasing amount is being diverted through the pressure relief valve and less is available to the system. The amount of diverted flow steadily increases as pressure approaches the full open value. This is to suggest that an operator operating at regions near the set limit might show a lag in speed since an increasing portion of flow rate is being diverted through the progressively increasingly open pressure relief valve. This being said, we only experience this at regions very close to the set limit when an actuator is just about to stall out at the limits of travel anyways. Adjusting the pressure relief valve set value up or down, one would have to use an approximation of these curves to determine the behavior at other settings. Alright, that's about it. In conclusion, we disassembled and examined an actual pilot-operated pressure relief valve identified those components that made it function, and interpreted part numbers and data sheet entries. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource, and be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates.